Hey, I'm Ron Rodos, and welcome to our journey through the real book number 212, Lines and Spaces by Joe Lovano. This was one of his early tunes. It's what helped him make his uh, reputation. And uh, as we're doing with all these jazz piano lessons, we're looking at how to approach this tune in a way that gets beyond, so to speak, the lines and spaces. What's the tune about? How does it... Um, uh, how does it relate to other jazz standards? How does it relate to, how does Joe Lovano relate to other composers? Who might be some of his influences? How do we approach the tunes? That's what it, you know, it's the, uh, the, the mental game, the inner game of, of playing jazz, right? Uh, so, uh, at, yes, it's the 212th tune. Sometimes, sometimes I get comments saying, it's on page 246, but you said it was the 212th tune. It's because I numbered the actual songs. So a lot of the tunes that have two pages in, on them, they only have one number because each tune has its own number. So there's, there's 400 tunes in the real book, exactly, in the Hal Leonard 6th edition. And this is the 6th edition. Uh, this is the C for C instruments. If you play trumpet or another instrument, you might need to get a transposed book but, uh, or learn how to transpose them from the, the C. Uh, but basically, what, what's going on with li lines and spaces? It, I think it obviously means the, it's ref, it just refers to simply the lines on the staff and the spaces on the staff, the notes on the staff. It's interesting because, um, you know, uh, everybody's been writing with lines and, on the lines and spaces for, for hundreds of years and no one else thought of calling it to lines and spaces. It reminds me of two things off the top of the, uh, uh, top of the bat. Um, uh, first, there was a quote by Bach, the composer Bach somewhere. Now, he was a great teacher, great teacher. He knew how to take people step by step and teach them how to improvise, even fugues and, you know, counterpoint. You know, improvise uh, uh, imitation in imitative counterpoint. But uh, at one point, I, th I think he was a great sight reader, apparently, and someone, one of his students or somebody asked him, you know, how, what's the secret of, you know, of, of reading music at sight, of really, really, really playing great? And he said, well, it's simple. You just play the notes the right notes at the right time, you know, where they're notated, in other words, on the staff. And uh, I don't know if that's the, probably a, a flippant, fun remark, right? It reminds me in uh, 1988 when I was Jerry Mulligan's assistant, the great jazz saxophonist, you know, sometimes these great musicians, they just, um, they, 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 they just think a little differently than we do. And sometimes it's hard for them, I've noticed, to explain what they do. Sort of like that Bach comment, although I think he probably could have explained it better if he wanted to. He was having fun with that. But I remember Jerry Mulligan, I spent about a year at his house, mostly every day. We went to Europe a few times. I was his assistant, so I played a little piano at his house if you needed to hear something he had written on the piano or something, and you know, he wanted to hear someone else play it, or sometimes he would even ask me about a chord symbol. What, what's the best way to notate this or, or whatever? Is it a, a minor with a flat six or is it a first inversion major triad or something? And, uh, but mostly it was administrative stuff, photocopying music, hanging out, sometimes just hanging out, you know. Uh, but uh, he used to do the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle. I mean, he was unbelievable at it. And I can't do crossword puzzles. So let's say this was the crossword puzzle, the hardest, one of the hardest ones. He would take a, uh, not a pencil, where he could, we could, he could erase, but he would take uh, a marker, like a Sharpie, and he would start it, you know, and, and he would just do the whole thing in like, I don't know, half hour or something. It'd take me probably three, three hours to get 10 answers. So I asked him once, I said, Jerry, how, how do you do crossword puzzles? I'm not that good at it. And I, he, he just, he thought a second and he said, okay, well, what you do is you start on the top corner and you answer that question. And then you just work your way across the page until the whole thing's done. And I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> like that doesn't help me. But in any case, but that was his honest answer because that's what he did. So it's funny, sometimes these musicians, they, they just think a little differently than we do. So uh, lines and spaces, you, you look at a tune like this, um, it's not an older jazz standard, it's from the 90s, right? And um, what does it say? Yeah, 1991 here, I think the, the album was released in 92. Michelle Petrucciani on the album, the pianist, great pianist. And um, Joe Lovano plays tenor saxophone, one of the greats. Very melodic, very uh, playing from the heart. And um, uh, he, he's, he's sort of in that lineage of Wayne Shorter. You know, I think his sound is a little softer uh, than, than a Coltrane, you know, like Wayne's is. 
Uh, and uh, I, there's an interview where he interviews Wayne Shorter on YouTube. And it seems to me the chords here are from that sort of, uh, they're, they're, there's a few two five ones, like in uh, bars four, five, six, seven. Six and seven is a two five one in G minor. But other than that, you know what? First of all, it starts on a diminished seventh. It's one of the few diminished seventh chords in the real book. There's not too many. In older jazz, you would have heard a lot of diminished sevenths or you know, Gershwin. And, and they've sort of been taken out and replaced by minor two five ones or things like that, uh, or, or dominant sevenths, alter dominant sevenths in, in a lot of post bebop. But basically, diminished chords are great. You know, they're very evocative. And you can use diminished scales for improvising over them. Um, so what's going on here? And then you look at his melody, and it starts... Uh, what's that? It's very chromatic, and it's like the sidestepping thing. It's from the scale, but it, it doesn't line up with the chord the way that, at least, that I would sort of naturally do it. So. Um, uh, this is something, you, you know, you have to sort of practice and say, what's he doing? What's he doing? Okay. And then he goes right to a... That doesn't work with the chord. And then he finally resolves in bar three. It's like, oh, what is this chord's progression? It's almost like a 2-5-1 here. Right? It's almost like... It kind of feels like a 2-5-1. But mm, really, so, so just like with Wayne Shorter's music, uh, there's an element of very traditional stuff. Um, staying on one chord for a few measures, a 2-5-1 in bars um, uh, 6 and 7. But there's also something that's very untraditional or, or modern at the time, contemporary at the time it was written. So to sort of float from chord to chord, that isn't what's called, quote, functional harmony. It's not going around the circle of fourths. It's by feel, D, D to D flat, and then to B, not even to C. It's like, how does that? But then after this sort of first two measures of harmonic uncertainty, it's grounded just by the sheer fact that we stay on B minor seven for two full measures, and the melody just lingers there. So I think Lovano, um, he's playing with okay, this is really hard and this is really easy. Or this is kind of strange and this sounds a little more uh, traditional. Or this is uh, harmonically vague and this is harmonically certain. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of meandering and I'm home. You can look at it all these different ways and there's a play between that. Um, just like there's a play, I guess, between lines and spaces, by analogy. Um, and then there's some um, relations in the tune, some, some logical uh, connections that aren't always apparent. Like, for instance, uh, it's got 16 measure sections. So the first 16 bars are a section, then it basically repeats for 16 bars, and then there's really eight measures of just A minor at the end which again is grounding it, eight measures of the same chord, modally, it's a Dorian mode basically with some chromaticism. So uh, if you look at this first section, at first glance, I mean the melody is all over the place, but then I see that the first four bars and the, the um, uh, what is it, measures uh, 13 through 16, the last four bars of that section. So the first line and the fourth line have the same chords. So even, and the melody is almost the same, but not with this opening, you know. Um, by the way, I like playing that in octaves. Sort of like a, maybe a Herbie Hancock would do something like that. I tend to play C natural. Um, you might want to write in on the uh, sixth note uh, flat, just to remind you. So I do like a stop time. I, I don't really keep the beat. I don't play like a walking bass line over the first measure. I'll usually just go and then I come into the beat. So sort of add my own little take on this. So uh, how do you start improvising on a tune like this? Well, it's interesting because it, it, if you listen to the recording, there, there's a lot of chromaticism in there. And for me, it's sort of like I'm, I'm thinking of the chords 
but you can't play your usual bebop licks on all this stuff. But you can, it works sometimes, but it's not really the style. It's, it's taking a clue from the melody. What's he doing here? There he has the E minor seven, E flat minor seven, bar eight, and he's got the major seventh, and then the minor seventh, and then he goes to, and he's got major seventh here. So he's playing some notes that aren't quite the obvious notes in the chord. So we can experiment with that when we're improvising too. So to me, it's almost like I'm taking the, the usual stuff I play and just sort of smudging the ink a little bit. So, you know, if it was an E flat minor chord, I might play stuff that's a little outside the changes and then come back in. And that's an element of this style too. So it, it lets us stretch ourselves musically as we're learning a, a fun tune to play. So um, that's a big overview of where this tune uh, might come from, how we can approach it, how we can understand it, and how can we can sort of over time make it our own so that it becomes just as natural as playing body and soul or take the A train. Uh, so uh, there we go. I'm just gonna uh, uh, go for it. It's not a tune that you hear on solo piano a lot, so I might try some different textures, some walking bass, um, it's a, just a medium tempo groove. It's not, it's not particularly fast, which is kind of nice, you know, um, it's approachable. All right, here we go. Joe Lovano's Lines and Spaces. <laughs>
Whoa. The, the, the fun thing is you don't really know where a tune like this is going to take you, you know? And, um, and it, 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 I mentioned Wayne Shorter before. I think it also comes out of that kind of Ornette Coleman kind of vibe. Like you're, you're playing a phrase and then you let the phrase... You let the phrase develop in terms of the tonality. So there, I just played something in, in F minor, and then I did it up a step in G minor, and extended it and led, led into a little bit of A flat minor, because it, 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 it was suggesting that to me melodically. Independent of the chords here, you could try that over anything. What if, I, what if when I got to the, um, uh, the B minor in bar three, I did that, I started on F minor. So I'm starting here. So I superimpose this chord progression of F minor, G minor, A flat minor over B. You know, and that's Wayne Shorter, that's Ornette Coleman, that's Herbie Hancock. Um, the, uh, the thing that makes it sound logical, to my ears at least, is the development of a motif and letting the motif sort of suggest, okay, this has a logic. Not just playing outside for the sake of playing outside. And, I, and it, just for my personal taste, Wayne Shorter is the best at doing that. When he plays outside, it sounds logical. It's like he's putting a splash of green and then a splash of red and then a splash of blue over this yellow or something. It's like a collage. And it, it's logical how he's getting there. It's not, okay, well, I'm going to play an F minor over, over B, you know. Um, uh, which might be more of an Eric Dolphy approach, who actually is one of my favorites as well. But I like how Wayne gets us there. Wayne takes us on that journey from inside to outside, probably, in my opinion, better than anybody else. So lots of food for thought here um, with some lines and spaces. Thanks for joining me. Um, uh, we're working through the real book one a week, and um, uh, thanks for being along for this ride. Good luck with your own music. Work really hard, practice, 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 practice. I don't always emphasize that, but you could work on a tune like this for uh, six hours straight and just take four bars and oh, how can I get through this? How can I get through that? You know, um, Just immerse yourself in the music. Have fun every step of the way and let the music flow.